So hello everyone, it's the weekend here in my lab where I can sneak in and enjoy the quiet and settle down with a nice scientific paper. And here, brand new, is a clinical trial for ME-CFS. And clinical trial results always take precedent for me when I do these videos because that's what this research is all ultimately about. So let's take a look at these new results. These are not from my lab, this is from another group. And let's see if this treatment is something for the field to get excited about. And you're also, you're welcome to look at this paper. It's available to everyone, as far as I can tell. I've got a link below in the description, and so you can look at the same paper I'm looking at. So here's the paper. It is low-dose rapamycin alleviates clinical symptoms of fatigue and post-exertional malaise in ME-CFS patients via improvement of autophagy. A long list of clinical scientists, um, several of whom have been in the ME-CFS field for a long time or on this paper. The funding was from Cimarron Research, and this is a company looking into this treatment. I do want to note that the lead author uh, graduated from Cornell and now works with Cimarron, and the senior author also works at Cimarron. So this is a pharmaceutical company paper, and that's fine, but it's something that you have to keep in mind. Now, another thing to keep in mind is this is a preprint, which means it's being made available to the public before peer review. And that's very important. We expect there to be changes, maybe minor, maybe major. The purpose of preprint is to allow people to give early feedback, which is what I'm doing right now. And it's also to get information out to interested individuals faster. But keep in mind that huge caveat to everything said when the paper is at this stage. This is going to be an overview of the paper with a focus on efficacy and side effects and safety. When the final version is published, I'll look into it in more detail. So looking at the abstract, we see that they tested this treatment in 86 ME-CFS patients, and they're using 6 milligrams per week of rapamycin, and this is an oral formulation. Now, they test ME-CFS symptoms on baseline and also day 30, 60, and 90. They report no serious adverse events. And of the 40 patients, 72.5% showed recovery in post-exertional malaise, fatigue, orthostatic intolerance, and improvements in other questionnaires. Now, this is an incredible response rate. And it instantly raises suspicions in me because the idea that a single drug can significantly help over 70% of ME-CFS patients. It's almost impossible. Um, we know that ME-CFS, that label encompasses at least three different pathophysiologies, and we would expect those to need different treatments. But I'm a scientist, uh, being suspicious is part of the job, so we have to keep an open mind. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, now it's unclear in the abstract why they say 40 patients, what happened to the other 46 patients. That's something that needs to be fixed in the abstract and we'll go into that a bit deeper in a little bit. And they conclude that low-dose rapamycin effectively reduces post-exertional malaise and other key symptoms of ME-CFS. Now if that conclusion is true, then this is an important advance for ME-CFS patients. For sure. Now, in terms of the introduction, the short story is we have no FDA approved meds for MECFS. That needs to change. Absolutely. Um, rapamycin is an mTOR inhibitor. Uh, in general, the drug inhibits immune responses. So it's classically used as an immunosuppressant to help transplanted organs from being rejected by the body. So it's a quite powerful immune suppressant. But more recently, people have been using low-dose rapamycin, and it's been studied for its ability to increase lifespan in animal models. And so it's protecting against aging. It's also being studied for its ability to suppress chronic inflammation in conditions like long COVID. And so there's a rationale for trying this in ME-CFS, and there's some preliminary data supporting this kind of study. But the rationale is just a story. So I want to see the results. So let's look into that. Now, this is a non-controlled study, which means there's no placebo condition, and that always limits the interpretability because we don't know how much of the improvement was due to the drug or something else. It's decentralized, meaning there wasn't a core site. It involves six different clinical centers across the United States. 
Now, these were ME-CFS patients, but there's not much information on the inclusion and exclusion criteria, except the participants, they had to meet the IOM or Institute of Medicine criteria. Now, they used a lot of different symptom tools, but I don't think any of them were defined as primary. So I think they were just exploring what symptoms may best respond to the treatment, which is fine at an early phase. And there are also lots of blood tests, but we're not going to go into that uh, right now. It's just too complicated. Now, how do they determine who responds to the drug? Uh, it's a bit too complex to cover now. Um, the problem with MECFS clinical trials is that different patients are affected by the disease in different ways. And so it's really hard and maybe impossible to find a single thing that adequately tracks improvement in all patients. And so this team came up with multiple ways that you can show response. Uh, for example, they use the short form 36, which is very popular across all of clinical biomedicine. And if you respond in two of the four subscales they looked at, you're considered a responder. And those subscales are vitality, social functioning, physical problems, and the physical composite score. And they do similar things with the multiple fatigue inventory or MFI and other scales. And I really apologize. It would take me at least 30 minutes to properly explain the outcomes. And so right now, you can read the paper if you're interested in how they tracked improvement. Basically, I'll say that the outcome approach has merit and there's background support for this approach. For the patient, I basically just hope that you feel better and you're able to do more of the things that you want to do. And that's what these tools are trying to measure. Uh, it's just harder than you might think to do objectively. Um, so let's look at the results. Now, first we look at attrition, which is how many people stopped the study prematurely. Now we see that 86 people started the treatment, um, but 46 completed the 90 day trial. Now the abstract said 40, so I'm not sure why, what the difference between the 46 and the 40, that might be a mistake, I'm not sure. But regardless of whether it's 40 or 46 completing, we do have a problem here, and that appears that at least 50% of the participants stopped the study prematurely. And that's an atypically large attrition rate. And it suggests either a problem with the study infrastructure or with adverse events. Uh, we would expect way more participants to stay in the study till the end. Just in comparison, I've run over 500 patients in trials that last 10 months. And I have an average of 95% completion. Only 5% of my participants stop studies prematurely. And in this study, we're seeing 50%. So there's clearly some kind of problem. Now, they state that the most common reason for stopping early is financial barriers because the study drug costs were not covered and the laboratory tests were not covered by the study sponsors. And that means participants had to pay to be in the study. Now, I've never had participants pay to be in a study, um, so that may very well explain the high attrition. That makes sense. But there's a problem. If there's a cost, then only the people who are getting a benefit are likely to stay in the study, which means your final sample is going to be biased. It's going to contain those people who responded well. So I don't know. It would be good to know what the average cost was for people completing the study. Was it $100, 1000 10000 I just don't know. That would be useful. In any case, they do provide a table to show why people left early. Uh, the main reasons were GI, gastrointestinal issues, insomnia, a little bit of headache, I think one person, and then lack of efficacy and financial issues. And all that looks reasonable. Now, in the paper, they say the main reason is because of cost. But we can see in the table that that may not be true. It seems like the number one reason is actually lack of efficacy. Now, when I look into the results, things start to get pretty messy for me. Uh, the main thing is it's not clear to me whether the tests are only being conducted on the 40 completers. Uh, they never explicitly say who's included in the test. But given they say that 40 are being um, described in the demographics, it suggests to me that they've excluded everyone who didn't get through the full 90 days. And I have a huge problem with that. If I were a peer reviewer, I would not let that get past. Um, you can't restrict efficacy analyses to only those who complete. The people who drop out are very informative because they're the ones most likely to have negative responses to the treatment. If you don't include them, you're going to drastically inflate the uh, efficacy of the treatment. You know, imagine 
that you're supposed to find out what a hundred people think of a new movie. And then the movie starts and then half of the people leave halfway through the movie. And then at the end of the movie, you ask the people still in the theater what they thought and they all said they liked it. So then you report that everyone likes the movie. Okay. But what about the 50 people who left? They probably didn't like the movie, but their opinions are not being considered. And so your final report is biased and it's misleading. Now, there's many statistical approaches for addressing dropouts. Uh, the most conservative way is to count dropouts as non-responders. And sometimes that's too conservative, but it is a way. Now, if we do that, the positive response rate goes from 72.5% to 34%. Now, of course, that's much less, but really it would still be great to have a drug that significantly benefits a third of MECFS patients. I think that would be a very helpful tool. Um, now we start looking at the results. And all I can say is we can't go through this. I'm counting over 100 statistical tests. And as I just said, any outcome test that doesn't include dropouts is, in my scientific opinion, invalid. That combined with the lack of placebo control means there's just no way for me to know if these results truly indicate a pharmaceutical benefit to this drug. Uh, but I'm, I am looking at dozens of positive effects. I see benefits for fatigue, post-exertional malaise, sleep problems, orthostatic intolerance, emotional well-being, social functioning, and more. So I see that some people clearly had a good experience with this treatment. Um, so rapamycin may be very helpful for a subset of MECFS patients. And what I'm not covering here is that the research team is running a lot of tests to figure out who might respond well and what may be changing physiologically that leads to symptom improvement. But it does get really, really complex. And so I'm going to hold off on that for now. Uh, these videos I do are really for patients and caregivers. And the bottom line assessment is there's not enough scientific evidence to support recommending low-dose rapamycin right now. This study, it really isn't for patients. It's not for clinicians. This is for researchers and how it might inform their current studies. And it's really for the scientific team to gain information on how they can properly design a true efficacy trial. This tells them what to expect, what symptoms may respond, how to account for attrition, what blood tests to run. And this study does do that. So I think it accomplishes its mission. There's a wealth of information here for planning a proper trial. So as long as we accept the study for what it is, basic preliminary data, then it's successful. Um, but it should no, in no way change prescribing habits right now. That's way too premature. I have heard that the team uh, has gotten funding for a larger clinical trial, so keep an eye out for that. I may get some more information, and I'll do a talk on that soon. In the meantime, you can always check clinicaltrials.gov to see if the trial is recruiting, and you might be able to enroll in that. So anyway, I've talked enough. Again, uh, just trying to keep you up to date on the scientific advances being made right now. I appreciate any group that puts in the enormous effort needed to test treatments. For conditions like MECFS, the work is hard, it's sorely needed, and we need a lot more of it. So that's all for now, and I will be back soon.